Hello, everybody. Um, I am Clarissa O'Quinn. Um, so it seems like everyone's in who's going to be in. Um, so I'm Clarissa O'Quinn. I'm the staff assistant in the district office for the Congresswoman. Um, I'm thrilled and honored to work for Congresswoman Deborah Ross and help her to support the constituents of North Carolina's second congressional district. So thank you, everybody, for being here um, and for your interest in serving our country and for sharing your time with us. Um, just so you all know, this event will be recorded and will be posted on our website. So if you want to refer back to it, you're more than welcome to do so. So as most of us are aware, um, I'm working to organize the Surface Academy nomination process for this office, and I am your first point of contact. Um, if you have any questions at any time, you're more than welcome to reach out. So we will be accepting nomination applications until November 1st, and um, the application can be found on our website which is ross.house.gov. Um, like I said, if you have any questions about that application, feel free to reach out. And then um, after all of our applications are in, we're gonna have a review committee um, to kind of pare down that list and that candidate pool. And then in early December, we will have an interview board um, and interview the top candidates, which is gonna be really exciting. And then um, we're aiming to have all nominations solidified and submitted before the holidays. So it'll be a nice way to end the year. So my name and email address are on the flyer that you received, um, but it'll also be posted in the chat. So it's just my first name dot my last name at mail.house.gov. And then um, our office number is going to be on there too. And you can always ask for me and I'm always around. So feel free to share that with whomever you would like. Um, if you know anyone who wants to connect for more information, feel free to give it to them. Um, also, um, today, we will be hearing from representatives from four service academies, the ones which require nominations. And then we're also going to hear from two members of our military advisory board who have been tremendously helpful with the entire nominations process. So following the individual 10-minute presentations, we're going to have breakout rooms, um, which I think will be really exciting to be able to have that one-on-one -on -one interaction. Um, and so all the presenters will be answering questions and the breakout rooms will be named according to the academy. So it'll be pretty self-explanatory. Um, you're welcome to jump between them. And then we're also gonna have a room for questions for this office. So we ask that you save all of your questions until the very end. Um, you, like I said, you can have that one-on-one -on -one interaction. So it's you know good to keep it till the end. Um, and then it looks like everyone's kind of on it already, but if you could please keep your cameras and microphones off during the whole thing, um, that would be great. And there are instructions for how to like put Zoom into speaker mode um, in the little chat section. It's also in the email that I sent you. So I would now like to introduce retired Lieutenant Colonel Steve Wilson, who's been essential to the entire planning process. I would not have been able to do any of this without him. Um, he's leading the Surface Academy subcommittee of our military advisory board. And it really has been such an honor to work so closely with him. So Steve, take it away. Thank you very much. Uh, there are many ways a person can serve the public. All of you are students in high school. And guess what? All your teachers and all the school administrators are public service employees. So public service is defined as work done by someone for the benefit of everyone. Examples would be the teachers and the administrators, firemen, policemen, uh, the court systems, elected folks, and of course, people in the military. Uh, I was a pilot in the Air Force for 24 years. I served combat tours in both Vietnam and Saudi Arabia during the first uh, Gulf War. So public service is near and dear to my heart. So I'm very pleased to be able to work on this uh, committee and select the next generation of leaders in our military. So today uh, we're gonna talk about how you can enter a service academy, which leads to five years of public service as an officer in the military service. Uh, one way you can enter a service academy is through a congressional nomination. Uh, this would be through your U.S. congressman or congresswoman or U.S. senator. Uh, today, it, was, it is my pleasure to introduce Congresswoman Deborah Ross, who represents North Carolina Congressional District 2. Uh, she was elected last year. She serves on the Science, Space, and Technology Committee and also the Rules and Judiciary Committees. She lives in Raleigh. Uh, and is married to Steve Wren. It is her honor to nominate deserving students to an appointment to a service academy. 
Congresswoman Ross, could you take it away and please tell the uh, audience why public service in the military is important to you? Well, thank you so much, Steve, and thank you for serving on my military advisory committee. I could not um, have a better group of dedicated folks who have served in the military all over the country and in different branches of the military. And your advice to me and your wisdom and your perspective have been invaluable, particularly during these very difficult times. So thank you for everything that you do. And thank you for heading up um, this Service Academy group because we're gonna get the next generation of bright, talented people to serve in our military. I want to thank all the students who have joined today for your interest in serving our country and for being engaged members of the community. If you're interested in serving and being part of the military academies, we know you are already involved in your communities. And we want to just thank you for your energy and for your enthusiasm. This is a, an especially difficult time in our country and in our world. As you know, we're facing the coronavirus, which is a health crisis. We're facing environmental crises and we're facing difficulties abroad. And you are willing to serve. And that just warms my heart. I also want to thank the extraordinary panelists who you'll hear from for your service to our country and for joining this discussion to ensure that students know every opportunity available to serve in our nation's service academies. I'm the proud daughter of a former Air Force physician. And it's an honor and a privilege to nominate students to the service academies. Now you know that there's no higher duty than serving your country. And the five service academies offer unparalleled education resources to students who answer this call. Leadership is so, so crucial. And we're gonna need a different kind of leadership going forward. We're gonna need your talent. We're gonna need your courage. We're gonna need your compassion. And we're going to need people who look forward to tackling our problems in a way that can help all of our people. Today, you're going to hear from representatives from the U.S. Military Academy, the Naval Academy, the U.S. Air Force Academy, and the U.S. Merchant Marine Academy. And they will share more information about their academies and the immense opportunities available to you, as well as the obligations and commitments that come along with attending a service academy. If you have any questions about seeking a nomination to one of the service academies, please don't hesitate to reach out to my office. You can contact Clarissa. And I look forward to reviewing the applications of all the talented, bright young people who seek to serve our country. And I look forward to the guidance of my Service Academy volunteers who will help me identify the folks who will do the absolute best job serving our country. I wanna thank you once again for your interest and commitment to our nation. And I wanna thank our panelists for your service to our country and offering guidance to the next generation. Now I'd like to introduce Colonel Brian Doyle, who is a member of my Service Academy volunteer staff and a 1991 graduate of the Air Force Academy. Colonel Doyle, take it away. Thank you, ma'am. As Congresswoman Ross shared, I'm Colonel Brian Doyle, recently retired from the U.S. Air Force and a 1991 graduate of the Air Force Academy. In addition to being a graduate, I've had the opportunity to work with over 200 North Carolina students as an admissions liaison officer for the Air Force Academy over the last 20 years. So I'm well versed on what it takes to earn admission and to succeed at the academies. As you probably know, attending a service academy is a tremendously unique experience compared to a civilian university. Beyond that, each academy has its own unique experience. So we're going to start this portion of this afternoon by sharing some of the common features 
of the various service academies, still very different from a civilian university. And then, like you heard, the reps from each of the academies will describe what makes their academy different from the others. So first up, we'd like to show you a brief video, less than six minutes, which is an overview of the academies. And then I'll be back with some additional detail about how the academies are similar. The Air Force Academy at Colorado Springs. The U.S. Military Academy at West Point. The Naval Academy at Annapolis. The Coast Guard Academy at New London. And the Merchant Marine Academy at Kings Point. These are America's service academies, the five-pointed star. Each year, thousands of cadets and midshipmen enter our nation's service academies. They come from all walks of life and bring with them a variety of experiences. The common thread is to be challenged at the highest levels and serve our country in the most noble of professions. Cadets and midshipmen at America's service academies accept a lifestyle that is unique and demanding. Though they differ in terms of their history and missions, the military academies have more in common than most people think. The service academies all offer a rigorous four-year program. Their main focus is on developing leaders to serve our nation in peace and during conflict. Every cadet and midshipman receives a fully funded education, including tuition, room and board, and health care. And upon graduating with a Bachelor of Science degree, they are commissioned as officers in the uniformed services. Each academy is rated as a top undergraduate college. All offer majors in engineering, math, science, and the humanities. When cadets and midshipmen graduate, they take with them lasting friendships. They forge lifetime bonds under the intense pressure and the high moral and ethical standards demanded by our service academies. They are prepared to rely on each other to get the job done. Our academies are not only focused on providing a first-class education, but on training and leading. Cadets and midshipmen are a part of a very special team, America's team. These are the young men and women we turn to in order to maintain our national defense. It's a big job, but these academy grads are very well prepared. We look for well-rounded candidates, individuals who demonstrate character, academic prowess, physical toughness, and the potential not only to excel at the academy, but also to excel as officers after graduation and likely make a career of the Air Force, Army, Navy, Marine Corps, Coast Guard, or Merchant Marine. A healthy balance of these assets is considered by our admission boards. Cadets and midshipmen are taught by men and women who are top in their field. The ratio of students to teachers is among the lowest in the nation. The primary mission for instructors and professors is classroom teaching. Equipment is state-of-the-art. The unique challenges are unmatched. No other school offers the range of opportunities available at a service academy. In keeping with a famous quote by General Douglas MacArthur, that on the fields of friendly strife are sown the seeds that on other fields, on other days, will bear the fruits of victory. All cadets and midshipmen are athletes, and every athlete is challenged. The academies share a belief that the competition and teamwork learned on the playing fields reinforce the team spirit needed to get the job done. At the service academies, there is both an officer and undergraduate chain of command. Cadets and midshipmen have a chance to develop and practice personal leadership skills. To be a leader, you must learn to follow. That's why upperclassmen have a great responsibility in training lowerclassmen. It's about becoming a leader who will inspire respect and obedience even under the most trying of circumstances. Our cadets and midshipmen are taught how to keep their heads when things get tough, to make the right decision the first time. They see what is required and make sure it is carried out, learning through their mistakes. 
the principal rule of conduct is based on honor. Cadets and midshipmen do not lie, cheat, or steal. Just as they learn to use the most advanced technology in the world, these young men and women also develop an inner confidence that keeps them pointed on the path of honor and integrity. <coughs> in the process, <coughs> cadets and midshipmen join a long and distinguished line of academy graduates. These graduates inspire on the strength of their vision and the courage of their team. Service Academy graduates excel in every sphere of influence, from general and admiral to government leaders and captains of industry. Some say that much of the history taught at the academies was made by graduates who went before. Our country expects a great deal from our cadets and midshipmen to make them the best in their chosen field. Academy graduates prove worthy of this assessment by the way they perform their postgraduate service opportunities. It all comes down to this. For those who want to reach their potential, they have the help they need to find it. America's Service Academies, the Five-Pointed Star. Excellent. So hopefully that short video gave you just a feel for how the service academies are similar. And they say a picture is worth a thousand words. So hopefully it played out that way for you. At the same time, though, I recognize that there's a lot of detail behind attending a service academy. So let's get into that. And if we can bring up my slides, we'll, uh, we'll talk through some of these common features. Sec. Great, thanks. So like the video alluded to, the service academies are attended by the very top students from around the country and we'll explain what that means. There are also the amazing opportunities that aren't found at any other college. Like you saw in the video, there was flying airplanes, jumping out of airplanes, sailing a ship, driving a tank, language immersion in a foreign country, and so on. If you attend and graduate from a service academy, you're going to learn to be a better leader, and you're going to learn to manage stress like a professional. There's always a point where it becomes very stressful in our lives. And, and what the Air Force Academy and all the other academies is gonna do is stress and stretch what you can do as a person so that when you engage in stressful activities, it doesn't bother you nearly as much as it does now or to people who maybe don't attend a service academy. You'll earn the right to serve your country as an officer. And that means you outrank about 75% of all the people in the military the day you graduate and you'll have financial independence. So that means tuition, your room, your meals, your medical and dental benefits are all paid for by the military and cadets and midshipmen are paid for their service. So think about graduating from college without any debt and think about getting paid to go to college. That's what you get out of the service academies. If you'll advance the slide, we do have some pretty unique admission requirements. There's an age requirement. You need to be a US citizen and unmarried without dependents because this is a full-time job going to school at a service academy. There are medical qualification requirements and there is a group called the Department of Defense Medical Examination Review Board that looks at all the records and decides if somebody is medically qualified to attend a service academy. And if at first blush you're not, you can apply for a waiver. So there are a, a couple different iterations of this. Certainly academic qualifications, and we'll talk about the details of these a, a little bit more later, but we'll look at grades, standardized tests like the ACT and SAT in a normal year in this era of COVID, um, oftentimes the schools are test optional, and your high school rank. Leadership is very important, and that includes sports and extracurricular activities. And then being physically fit, 
everybody will take a physical fitness assessment as part of their application process. In addition, it's very important that there's clean living at the service academies and from our, our candidates. So there is admission and then ongoing drug screening. So that's something, if that's a, a problem for you, it's, you know, you should be aware of it now. And then um, like, like you've heard already, uh, you need a nomination for everywhere except for the Coast Guard Academy, whether it be a congressional nomination, like we're talking about today, vice president, president, or from other sources. Uh, on the next slide, we'll talk about the academics. And it's important to note that each service academy is a four-year program. So while not every student comes straight in from high school, about 25% don't, it's still a four-year program. Everybody starts with basic training. Everybody starts as a freshman. All graduates earn a Bachelor of Science degree and a commission as a second lieutenant or an ensign. So again, you are commissioned as an officer right at graduation. Each of the academies has a strict honor code. And this is not just something that's up on a wall or a poster someplace that people kind of look at and ignore. At service academies, this is a big deal. You won't lie, steal, or cheat. All the service academies offer a broad core curriculum. And so what that means is that you're going to take some extra classes as part of your academics. If you want to major in engineering, that's awesome. You'll still take classes like English and history. If you want to major in political science or history, that's great too. But you'll still take engineering discipline classes, chemistry, physics, and so on. So it's that broad curriculum that turns into a well-rounded person and officer. The classes are very small, typically 12 to 20 people. And the instructors are there to teach the cadets and the midshipmen. They're not there to do research. They're not there to publish papers. They're there to make sure that you succeed. And I'm telling you, ha having worked with students over the last 20 years, if you get into a service academy and you are trying your hardest on the academics, you will succeed. These teachers are the most available of any colleges across the country, and every one of them will offer their cell phone at the beginning of the course. And if you have questions, you can reach out. They turn into awesome tutors during their off periods. Next slide, please. It is absolutely a military-oriented lifestyle, and that means getting up early, having a spotless room, having a spotless uniform. Everybody has some kind of, you know, quote unquote, after school job. So there's some kind of military job that you have. You attend your classes, you have athletics, you might be in clubs. And then at the end of the evening, everybody studies. So it is a long day, but it's a very rewarding experience. Each of the academies has unique summer military training. And it starts off with the basics and then moves into more advanced training. That could include, you know, maybe you're learning how to fly a glider, like actually pilot a glider as a freshman. And then as a junior or a senior, you are teaching other cadets how to fly that glider or teaching basic training or going overseas, doing research, even staying here at home and doing research at places like Google or Facebook. As the movie shared, every cadet midshipman is an, is an athlete. So if you play a varsity sport or a club sport, you're practicing every day. If you play an intramural sport, then you're practicing every other day or competing every other day. And there are a ton of clubs. Three of the service academies have 90 to 100 clubs apiece. Coast Guard and Merchant Marine have 18 to 20 clubs, but there's plenty to do outside of just the military aspect and the academic aspect. Next slide. As I said, you know, we're going to get into the academics a little bit more here. These are the average scores from the Air Force Academy class of 2025. The other service academies are similar to this. So you can look at those SAT and ACT scores. They're, they're pretty good. Uh, they're pretty high. The service academies 
uh, super score. So it's to your advantage to retake the SAT or ACT multiple times if you don't do great on the first one. A high GPA as well. You can see it's about all A's with a couple of B's on an unweighted scale, about 3.9 out of 4.0. Extracurricular activities are really important as well. So being a leader, and a leader can mean a lot of different things. It can be something in student government. It can be clubs at school. It can be a team captain. It can be church, Boy Scouts, Girl Scouts, volunteering in your community. All of these are great leadership opportunities and service opportunities, because what we're looking for are leaders of character. So people who are gonna be great leaders and people who care about somebody other than themselves. So you can see those stats. And then a lot of our successful candidates have a varsity letter. You don't necessarily need one, but being physically fit is absolutely important. Next slide. Of course, right now we're talking about the service academies and you're gonna hear from the representatives from all of the service academies that require a congressional nomination. So, so we won't hear from Coast Guard today, but we will hear from everybody else. If the service academies aren't for you and or you don't get into a service academy, there are some other options. One is college ROTC. So there's different levels of scholarships. This is when you participate in the ROTC program at NC State or UNC or you know, any other uh, college or university basically around the country. The requirements are similar to the service academies, although typically just a touch lower to get the most basic of the scholarships, a little bit lower academically, but still leadership is important. And, and I wanted to note that high school ROTC is not a prerequisite. It's a question I get often from students. Hey, I don't have ROTC at my high school. Is that going to be okay? It's totally okay because not everybody has that opportunity. There's also a chance to go to a preparatory school. So Air Force, Army, and Navy have their own prep schools. Coast Guard and Merchant Marine utilize others. And to apply to the prep school is the exact same application process as applying to the service academy itself. So in other words, when you apply to U.S. Military Academy at West Point, you are putting in your application and they are deciding if you were a good candidate for direct entry into West Point or if you would be a good candidate for their prep school. It's the same application. And typically the prep schools are created for otherwise strong candidates who just need a little bit more academic seasoning. Great leaders, maybe great athletes. Uh, but we want them to succeed when they get to the service academy. So maybe one more year of seasoning is a good idea. So that's a summary of how the service academies are similar. But as you would guess, each service academy has its own nuances. And so next up, I'd like to introduce Ben Lebrun from the United States Naval Academy to tell us a little bit more about it. Thank you, Brian. I really appreciate the introduction and I appreciate you all for being here tonight. Uh, my name is Ben Lebrun. Um, just a little bit about me. I unfortunately was not privileged to go to the United States Naval Academy, but I'm very eager to tell you a little bit more about what makes it special. Um, if you will move to the next slide, please, I'll get right into that. All right. So first off, the United States Naval Academy is located on the Severn River between Baltimore and Washington, D.C. It's a lovely spot. I love working there every day. I get to look out on the bay and see the tall ships going through the water. I hope that if you get a chance to come to the Naval Academy uh, as a candidate, tourist, or you know, looking at some of our virtual tours online, I really, really hope that you'll enjoy it. Um, it is a wonderful, wonderful place to be and also to learn. As you can see from this, we have a lot of things here for you to do. Obviously, that's you know just. Uh, it's not just a school, it's a place to live. Uh, next slide, please. And speaking of living, you can learn a little bit more about going to the Naval Academy for Candidate Visit by going to usna.edu and looking for Candidate Visits in the drop down menu. Now I'm gonna talk a little bit about majors as well because I feel like this is something that's really, really important and differentiates us from some of the other service academies. We are a STEM school primarily, we focus on the things that drive a modern Navy. So 
you'll see from this majors page, a lot of this is focused on math, science, engineering, and technology. Now, what that means is, if you wanted to go and study humanities, English, science, or uh, English, political science, chair, uh, Chinese, Arabic, any of these things, that is absolutely an option. But please do understand that you're still going to have to get involved with these STEM subjects at some point. So, you know, prepare yourself for that and understand that a lot of people do it. You can learn it too. If it's something you struggle with now, make that a priority and make that something that you can boast about when you apply to our academy. Uh, if you'll click one more time. Oh, good. There, the, uh, the miners came up. There we go. Hold on, if you go back real quick. Okay. We do have language minors as well. These do have to be taken with another major. Um, if you're somebody who wants to focus on uh, like foreign area studies there at the bottom, that's a very new one. You will be required to take a language minor with that as well. I also want to hit on this really quick as, as well. What you pick here does not determine what your career is. We have physicists who are helicopter pilots. We have history majors who are in the Navy SEALs. It doesn't matter what it is you pick so much as that you pick something that you're going to enjoy and something that you're going to do well at. Uh, don't pick something because you think it's what's going to help your career. Uh, next slide, please. All right, so we have very small class sizes here. The average class size is between eight to 10, uh, which means you're gonna get a lot of one-on-one -on -one time with your professors. This is not, uh, you know, giant lecture hall uh, study sections, you know, you're going to get an opportunity to meet with your professors and really engage with them. Uh, we also have a one-to-one -one civilian and military faculty ratio. And what I mean by that is most of the people you'll work with and meet are active duty military members. These are people who've been out to the fleet, they've been in the Marines, they've been on ships, and they can mentor you, not just in the classroom, but also on your career progression as well. So there's a lot to learn from these folks outside of the classroom as well. Uh, I highly recommend that, you know, if they engage with you, you take them up on it. By and large, they are some of the best folks you'll ever learn from uh, at any time in your naval career. Uh, next slide, please. So we also have sports. Uh, Brian touched on this, and I really appreciate it. Everyone's going to be an athlete. You're going to play a sport. Uh, this is just a very small section of some of the sports we have uh, from our varsity. Uh, for those who don't want to play a varsity sport or aren't interested in what you see on this page, that's fine. We have a huge intramural and club sport program as well. Uh, some of these clubs travel. So, I mean, you can get the same experience even if you're not quite uh, interested in going up to the varsity level or, or can't find a spot on there. Um, for those of you who are interested in learning more about some of the athletic opportunities at the Naval Academy, I recommend that you go to NavySports.com. Uh, there you can also schedule to talk with some of our coaches as well, and uh, they can kind of give you advice in the off season. Uh, next slide, please. So while you're at the Naval Academy, we're going to give you everything you need to succeed, right? And what I mean by that is you're not going to pay for things. When you come to the Naval Academy, we're going to pay your way through school, the full scholarship. So what that means too is you're gonna, you'll get your books, you'll get a laptop computer, things that some of your friends at other schools are having to struggle with, getting jobs after school. You're not gonna have to worry about that. This is an intensive program, so we need to give you the tools to succeed. And by and large, that's what you're gonna get here at the Naval Academy is we're gonna give you what you need to succeed. It's up to you to supply the effort, but you'll never lack for the material things that you need to perform uh, your best academically. Uh, next slide, please. There we go. So everybody who graduates, you're going to get a bachelor's of science. Yes, that means you're going to get a bachelor's of science in English, right? But it also means that you're going to be held to a high academic standard. For those of you who may have uh, sniffed in the news, about 18 people who are separated for cheating on a physics exam. Honor, courage, commitment. These are things that we don't just say. We believe them. And unfortunately, if that's not something that you can hold yourself to, please don't apply. But for those who your service commitment, um, and for those of you who are going into a specialized field of some kind, uh, there'll be additional service commitments uh, that could be, you know, a couple of years just for pilot training or uh, some additional years if you have postgraduate work as well. Next slide, please. 
And finally, here's a breakdown of the service assignments for the class of 2021. So the class of 2021, as you can see, went into what we call the big four, right, which is surface warfare, submarines, pilots, and the Marine Corps. 95% of the class more or less will go into these fields, but as you can see there on the right side in what we call the staff corps, we have folks who are going into more specialized fields. Uh, this, you know, these are more selective, they have a lot more requirements, uh, there's some more schooling involved as well. So it, you can see we've got some really cool stuff for you to go to, but notice you don't see any major requirements on this. I want to reiterate again, you can get into any of these career fields regardless of what you study. You just have to put forth the effort and demonstrate that you have the knowledge to succeed in one of these uh, career fields. Uh, next slide, please. Finally, I also wanna hit on the summer programs we have as well. The first one I have is the summer STEM program. So this is for folks who, um, they're not yet a junior in high school and you know they just wanna get a sense of, what do we do with the Naval Academy? So the summer STEM program is a great opportunity to see some of the programs, talk to some of the midshipmen, some of the faculty, and uh, you know get to do some really cool stuff. Program robots, as you can see, some of the uh, some of the kids working with pipettes. Uh, they also get an opportunity to you know program a drone and fly it around with an Xbox controller. It's really awesome. I highly recommend you go to the link at the bottom, usna.edu/admissions/stem, and please check it out. Uh, the next slide, please. And now we have summer seminars. Summer seminars for those who are what we call rising juniors, so people who are between their junior and senior year, uh, getting ready to finish their last year in high school. This is a chance to get a taste of what we do during Plebe summer, right, which is what we call the initial training period when you first come to the Naval Academy. Plebe summer is intense. Don't get me wrong. This is boot camp for midshipmen. But this is an opportunity for you to get in, see what it's about, see if it's something you like meet some of the people you're going to be working with, some of the instructors that will be teaching you once you get here. It's intense, it's competitive, but it is a absolutely, you know, not to be missed opportunity if you can get in. Uh, next slide, please. And finally, I do want to hit on this as well. The, the fiscal qualifications are very important. I'm not going to go over all these. Suffice to say is please do not wait to the very last minute to do this. We had some really, really awesome folks last year who unfortunately didn't prioritize their physical qualifications. And unfortunately, it sunk their ship, right? So please focus on these now. If any of you have any questions about what to do or how to do it, please feel free to reach out to us. We also have guides for the CFA on usna.edu. Uh, there's a lot of good information for you there. So please don't let this be what uh, takes down the wrong path. Next slide, please. And then finally, I'm just going to hit on these last few bits. We are a STEM school once again. So please, if you're not taking advanced sciences or advanced maths, now's the time to start doing it. Uh, you're especially going to want to focus on some of these pre-calc and uh, trigonometry, geometry, advanced geometries. Uh, if you are taking a chemistry, physics, or other science course, make sure it is one with a lab because we want to see that you not only know the science, but you can do the science. Uh, we already covered GPA. You do want to be in the top 20% of your class. You do want to take your SAT till you're satisfied with it. We encourage any advanced courses you take, even if they're not in science or math. And then finally, be a well-rounded person. Don't be somebody who's going to do a thousand things, but only dabble in them a little bit. Do something that is that you're invested in, that you're working hard with, something that you take pride in and can point to and say, these are the things I have done. Right. And even if you're not involved in something like that, make sure that you're a participant in a way that somebody says, I need this person on my team when they come to my my club or they come to my sport. They are indispensable. They push everybody to do their best. You don't have to be the captain of the football team, but be somebody who's recognized for their their commitment and their service. Uh, last slide, please. All right. Finally, these are all our socials. Please check us out here. Uh, if you have any questions, feel free to reach out to Clarissa or anyone else at the staff, and they can put you in contact with me or somebody who uh, you know, can help you at the Naval Academy. And then finally, guys, the very last slide, it's a picture of all the graduates throwing their caps up in the air. I, I was at one of these graduation ceremonies. The energy there is so powerful. 
I really do wish the best for all of you, even if you don't come to the Naval Academy, but I hope for all of you, you get a chance to experience this moment. It really is something special. Anyway, guys, I do want to turn it over now uh, to the major. So without further ado, if uh, Major Alexis Jones could come on. Thank you. Thanks, Ben. All right, so good afternoon, everybody. My name is Major Alexis Jones, as Ben mentioned. I am a 2007 graduate of the United States Military Academy at West Point. I served on um, active duty as a transportation corps officer for about five years, and I'm currently serving in a reserve capacity um, as a military academy liaison officer and in the field force supporting North Carolina 2nd District. So for the next few minutes, I want to talk to you about West Point. Next slide, please, Nate. I apologize in advance for my cat that's about to jump on camera. Um, so it's important to understand the West Point experience. You know, what does it mean to you as a candidate? The West Point mission, as we all know, is to develop leaders of character. This is not just about education. This is um, to develop you as a person. So your leadership and your leadership skills as well. And obviously we are a service academy. So service to the nation is inherent in what we do. Um, you're going to be asked to do selfless things. You're going to be asked to put your personal priorities aside in order to help the team. Um, this is just part of being a leader. This is the things that you will be taught at West Point. Um, in addition, we will challenge you academically, mentally, physically. We're going to push you to your limits and help you to find your boundaries and equip you to operate outside of your comfort zone. Um, these are great life skills to have, and you're going to be able to de develop these at West Point. Next slide, please. All right, so what does West Point offer? In addition to receiving a great education, um, we are ranked very highly. You can see some of our accolades here on the slide. And this is both amongst service academies and colleges across the country as well. So obviously we've got a great program in place. Um, every year people are competing for and receiving notable achievements in academia. Next slide, please. So what we have here are the branch opportunities um, that are available for you in active duty. So the branches are listed in the white text. As I mentioned earlier, I commissioned as a transportation corps officer. Um, these are the basic branches that you will initially commission into. What's nice, though, is that um, with the Army, with the Military Academy, um, there's a lot of flexibility in your career. So the Army is the largest branch of service. Um, and so if, for example, you were to commission into the Transportation Corps or Infantry, Military Intelligence, you've got flexibility to change your branch and pursue a different branch um, if your passion changes. Um, or, or if you want to be like me and say Transportation Corps for your entire military life career, you're able to do that as well. Um, that there are points in your career where you're able to transition laterally into a different career field. And so the subsequent career opportunities are highlighted in gold. So for example, we've got special forces, civil affairs, um, being an attorney with JAG, um, data analytics, et cetera. There are numerous functional areas that are available to you to transition into. Next slide, please. So let's talk about West Point and the campus and its history. So if you're not familiar with the terrain and the significance of West Point, I'm gonna take a second to review that. So during the American Revolution, uh, the British forces felt that the Hudson River, which you can see on the right side of the screen of this slide there, was of particular importance. Um, they wanted to control the river in order to divide the colonies and give them strategic advantage. But George Washington and the American forces decided that was not gonna happen. So they fortified West Point um, because of the unique bend in the river. And you can also see that in the, in the, the photo there, that bend in the river. Um, it made it really difficult for the British forces and the ships to navigate. So ultimately, um, West Point was chosen as a great place to install artillery batteries and um, to extend a chain across the river in order to help prevent the British from controlling the Hudson River. So this helped shift the strategic balance in the favor of the American forces. Um, it's a very interesting and impactful history that West Point stands on today. You can also see from the picture that West Point is a very dense campus. Um, your day starts in your barracks room and then whether you're going to class or to the mess hall to eat or to an athletic field, um, everything that you need is within a five to 15 minute walk from your barracks room. So you're never waiting on a shuttle bus to get you across campus and class isn't ever gonna be canceled due to snow because you can walk. Um, everything is at your fingertips. You're able to maximize your time on campus. Um, for training, for development, for what you came to West Point to do. Next slide, please. So let's talk about West Point more generally. Um, there is a legacy of leadership here. Um, so the people on the slide are some notable grads of West Point. Um, the experience on, excuse me, at West Point is focused on equipping you with leadership skills. And this is broadly applicable to both your military career, 
public and private sector service, whatever your passion is, you know, having these leadership skills and this capability just allows you to achieve great things. And I think you'd agree that many of the folks on the slide would say that development of their leadership started at West Point. Next slide, please. All right. So I just want to answer um, a quick question, a common question that we often get. What does plebe mean? What does a yearling mean or cow or a fursi? So when we say plebe, we're talking about a fourth class cadet or a freshman. Um, and then moving right along, yearling or yuck is a third class cadet or a sophomore. Cow is a second class cadet or a junior. And then a fursi is a first class cadet or senior. Next slide, please. Let's talk about a normal and typical cadet day. Um, so starting from the end, um, from 23.30, so about 11.30 at night until 5.20 in the morning, cadets are not allowed out of their rooms. Um, and then, you know, you, when Reveille comes, you're allowed to leave your room and participate in common ups, PT, or events, or go to work out. A lot of cadets like to get up and run early in the morning before classes start. Breakfast is about 6.50, 7 in the morning. Um, it is mandatory for plebes. Lunch is mandatory around noon for all cadets. Every day in the mess hall, you'll sit in your designated seating area. Um, morning classes, excuse me, you've got classes both before and after lunch, as you can see there, class and study time. And, and that's important to note, you know, you might not have classes all day. So depending on your class schedule, you might have a few free hours to complete your homework during the day. That way your evening study period or personal time is all personal time and no study time. So as was mentioned earlier, every cadet is, is an athlete at West Point and at all service academies. So you will play a sport, um, whether it's NCAA club or intramural. Um, and so that's from about 1600 until 1800. And then of course we've got dinner at 1800. Um, dinner is buffet style every day. It, and it is optional except for Thursdays. Thursdays is mandatory dinner or a spirit, spirit dinner. And then personal time in the evenings, as I mentioned before, it's either evening study period or personal time, depending on how much homework you've got. And then 2300, 2330 will be taps and room check. Next slide, please. All right, so the advantage of West Point and other service academies, we've got small classes. This was highlighted before, so I won't spend too much time here, but this is true for most of your general education classes, your core classes, which will take your, your plea minyak here. As you move further into major classes, the sizes, if you can imagine, are gonna get even smaller. So I was an engineering psychology major and my class sizes range from five to 10 people. Um, and this was also touched on, but all faculty are gonna be subject matter experts. So um, their SMEs and their field are always willing to help. Um, you can email your teachers any time of the day or the night. They're, they're always there, they're always looking for ways to help. You just have to ask, just reach out. Next slide, please. Okay, so we've got 36 different academic majors. Um, as I mentioned before, I was an engineering psychology major. We also have 15 minors available. Next slide, please. <clears throat> what you see here is a typical class schedule. This is year by year. Um, so plebe year, most of your classes, as you can see, there is a key or legend on the bottom there. So all of the classes in black are core or general education. Um, plebe year is gonna be mostly general education. Um, you're, you're with a little bit of military leadership mixed in. And then um, you'll see that your sciences are interchangeable depending on your major. Um, yuck year is when you will start to take some major courses. And then cow year, um, more major courses and some electives and same on with first year. You've got major classes, general education classes, et cetera. Next slide, please. When we talk about NCAA sports, um, common question that we get is, hey, how manageable is it to play an NCAA sport in addition to academics and you know the rigors of being at a service academy. And the answer is it's doable. If you manage your time well, you will succeed. I ran track at West Point, um, it's, it's possible. Next slide, please. Here we've got our club sports um, intramural, and intramural sports um, for those not playing club or NCAA. Next slide, please. All right, um, let's talk about the four-year military journey. Um, and this slide mostly focuses on the summers at West Point. So entry before your plea year is called cadet basic training at six weeks long. You're gonna be learning the basics of becoming a soldier, preparing you for West Point. Uh, before your yearling or yuck year, you've got um, cadet field training, which is four weeks long. This is gonna be focused, it's a little bit more tactical, focus on advanced field training. Before your cow and first year, this is when the fun begins. Um, your details are interchangeable. So you've got options to choose between. You've got uh, CLDT, which is more advanced leadership training. You've got CTLT, where you have the ability to sh uh, shadow a platoon leader for a few weeks in the field. Uh, people are often really excited about that detail. You've got your training details where you're able to lead cadets for CBT or CFT or SLE. Um, and then you also have an IAD, which is similar to an academic internship. Um, 
And you also have military IADs such as air assault, airborne school, et cetera. So lots of options there. I was able to knock out um, an IAD and CTLT in addition to going to um, airborne air assault. So next slide, please. Okay, so lots of broadening opportunities. Um, we kind of touched on this in the, in the last slide, but um, you do have the ability to go to different countries and study in different academies. A question that we often get is, hey, do I have to be a language major in order to study abroad? The answer is no, you do not have to be a language major. Um, there are a certain number of language classes that you do have to take, but you do not need to be a language major in order to study abroad. There are also a lot of IAD or internship opportunities available as well. Next slide, please. So let's talk quickly about admissions. So um, West Point is looking for those who've demonstrated excellent academic ability in addition to leadership potential and your overall fitness. So this, this slide just talks about the architecture of your application. We're looking at you as a whole person, as a whole candidate. So that's academic leadership and fitness. Um, it's weighted differently for each criteria. For example, academics, 60% of the weight, right? So we're looking at your high school GPA, whether that's weighted or unweighted, and your standardized test scores. Um, the next bucket is leadership, 30%. Um, those four SOEs, um, the school official evaluations that are that need to be submitted for math, English, um, a science, either chemistry or physics, and then PE. Um, we also are looking at your extracurricular activities. So your involvement outside of school, we're looking to see if you are able to demonstrate excellence both inside and outside of the classroom. And then finally, interviews. Um, this fills a gap between what's on your official transcript and then your application. It gives, us, gives West Point a better idea of who you are as a person, what your interests are and why um, your interests might be aligned to West Point. Um, and then finally, the last bucket, your fitness. You know, we've got 10% uh, weighted here. Um, there are six concurrent events. Um, ben touched on this in, during his briefing, so I'm not gonna get into the events, but um, long story short, you do have to pass these events and pass the CFA in order to get acceptance into West Point and any of the service academies. So take it seriously, train for it. Um, another thing to keep in mind that I'll point out is that it's the same test across all of the service academies. So um, if, for example, you're applying to more than one, you don't need to take the CFA in more than one time. You are able to submit your scores from example, for example, West Point into the Air Force Academy and vice versa. But just keep in mind that West Point does require you to submit videos for your pull-ups and your push-ups. So if you are planning to take the CFA for more than one academy, um, please make sure that you record those videos because West Point will require them. Your application deadline is the 31st of January, um, but please submit sooner if possible. Don't wait until the last minute. We talked about, Brian talked about Dodmerb and how long that process takes. You do not want to be caught at the last minute um, waiting to get cleared for Dodmerb. Um, and then miss the application deadline. So just finish your application early. Uh, the earlier, the better. Uh, the Dodmer process does take time. Reach out to myself, any field force or MALO member here in uh, the second district in order to um, get assistance if you have any questions. And the more nominations you get, the better. All right, so last slide I wanna touch on is, um, thank you, the um, summer leadership experience. So if you're a high school junior or younger and you're interested in learning more about West Point, um, we have a week-long experience hosted between your junior and senior year of high school. So this does not count as a bonus or a penalty for your application. It's just an opportunity for you to get to know West Point better. So you're able to stay in the barracks. You will attend academic workshops. It's a great experience. It gives you a flavor of the cadet life and you're able to apply in January of your junior year. And last slide, please, Nate. Thank you. So hopefully you're already following us on social media. Um, if not, come on and join us on all the channels. Our handle is West Point Admissions. Thank you all for your time. If you have any questions, I'll be ha happy to answer them a little bit later in the breakout room. And I will be followed by Lieutenant Commander Wheeler from the United States Merchant Marine Academy. Sure, you're on mute. About if I turn it on, that might help. Huh? <laughs> uh, the Merchant Marine Academy is a different animal than the uh, DOD schools. Doesn't mean that it's better, doesn't mean that it's worse. It just means that it's distinctly different. We fall under the Department of Transportation and we have several key differences. Um, I'll, I'll try to go by the slides, but I don't want to take up too much time. I try to stick to our 10 minutes. We're located up in New York on Long Island, about 15 miles uh, east of New York City uh, in what used to be William Chrysler's estate. It's right on Long Island Sound. Next slide. 
A lot of people wonder what uh, Merchant Mariners do. Uh, you, you must realize that, you know, there's no train tracks or uh, anything like that that go across the Atlantic Ocean or the Pacific Ocean. About 95% of the goods and services that come into this country and leave this country go by ship. And Congress way back in the 1930s realized that they needed to have competent and well-trained people working on these ships. And so that was the original purpose behind the establishment of the Merchant Marine Academy back in 1943. Next slide. You're gonna earn a Bachelor of Science like the other schools. Uh, one of the, I'll throw in the difference here, it may pop up on another slide, but it's a good place to bring it up here. We have a Y path here. One is a civilian path that you're gonna be allowed to choose and one is a military path. Uh, that's a distinct difference from the other two. If you choose the active duty path, you can choose any branch of the service that you want for a direct commission, just as if you graduated from a like service academy. You can choose Army, Navy, Air Force, Coast Guard, or Marine Corps, and you go straight to your next duty station uh, for your next stage in training. Two thirds of every class, however, choose to go into the civilian job market working since somewhere in the maritime industry. Uh, could be for Exxon, it could be for a port, could be for a, uh, a harbor, could be on a ship, um, lots of different opportunities. I wanna give one example here because I always like to throw uh, money in there. Um, we had a young man who worked with admissions for quite a bit during his four years here. He just graduated about seven weeks ago. He went down to Charleston, South Carolina and he registered for the Maritime Union Workers Union. And I stayed in touch with him because he did do a lot with admissions. 45 minutes after he was entered into the union computer, he was hired by Maersk, M-A-E-R-S-K, one of the largest, if not the largest container shipping companies in the world. So I dug for more information and he says, well, they hired me for two 77 day round trips goes from New Jersey over to Africa, over to Asia, and then works its way back, takes 77 days. Said they hired me for two consecutive 77 day trips. We don't have to be a math major to realize that that's about five months, 154 days. I said, what are, you gonna, what are they gonna pay you? He said, uh, $114,000 for five months. So about $22,000 a month, right after graduation, no college debt, uh, he doesn't even have to work for the rest of the year if he wants. And if he makes a good name for himself, that company will hire him probably on any of their 50 or 60 ships whenever he wants to work. So two thirds go that route. Not everybody's gonna get a job like that, but that's just a real life example that just, uh, just happened. Uh, the payback uh, for the free education with us, if you go active duty, it's the five years that was previously mentioned. If you get an assignment like a pilot's uh, assignment, that, that respective service has a longer commitment because they're gonna spend more money on you. Uh, but the Department of Transportation is five years. If you go the civilian route, you must stay in the maritime business for a minimum of five years. I always have to laugh at briefings where people think that that five years uh, is a burden. And I, uh, and I say, so what do you plan on doing after five years? You, are you just tired of making uh, triple digit money? Uh, you wanna go do something else? Uh, but you got to do it for five years. You're going to earn an unlimited Coast Guard license here, a master's certification, uh, which means you're, you're qualified to work on any size ship and any horsepower ship. You have to renew that at least once. And you have a concurrent service commitment in the reserve component of your choice, Army, Navy, Air Force, Coast Guard, or Marine Reserves. You get to choose which one you want. Next slide. Uh, we only have five majors here. So we fall well below the others in that aspect. And I would encourage everybody, I'm not trying to sell you a used car or anything like that. You, if you don't think that you can thrive on these five majors and what they're ultimately gonna give you at the end of your four years, you should go to one of the other service academies or you should go to another private school or public school but uh, you know, if you want political science or psychology, don't come here. They're not gonna add a major just for you. Uh, we're division three in sports, unlike the DOD schools that are division one. So if you assess your own athletic talent, uh, 
maybe you want to come and play baseball or basketball or something like that, but you don't figure you're a division one talent, you know, maybe give us a consideration because then you can probably come here and play at a division three school and be, and be in your competitive sport for, uh, for four years. We are division one in, in our waterfront sports of crew and offshore sailing as those are division one sports, no matter where you are. Next slide. Uh, sea year. This is another distinct aspect of our service academy. One, we're on the trimester system here, not the semester system. So three of your 12 trimesters that you're going to be at the Merchant Marine Academy are spent at sea, one entire academic year. None of your first year, none of your plebe year is at sea, none of your senior year is at sea. But half the time that you are a sophomore and junior, you're away from campus, and you're working on ships, ports, harbors, etc. You're gaining real world, real life experience. So when you graduate, that's one reason that young man was hired so quickly. He has a master's certification from the Coast Guard and a year's worth of experience. So he's uh, head and shoulders above his peers. Uh, so it's a very integral part. We send two, two plebes, two of your classmates, uh, including you, uh, on every assignment. One is an engineering major and one is a marine transportation major. And so you get to travel the world and, uh, and go with somebody that you know, one of your classmates. Next slide. Uh, the options, I've already covered that. I jumped ahead with the split in uh, active duty and military. Next slide. Next slide. It's all right, next slide. Uh, our window opens up on May 1st, so we're about halfway through the application cycle like the other service academies. Our application ends on February 1st. It's about 99% accomplished online. Uh, and like the other schools, we could probably all say that we're all looking for almost exactly the same kind of individual. I mean, if you have 1600 on the SAT, uh, you're a very smart person, but if, you've, if that's all you've done, you're probably not necessarily what any of the service academies want because they're looking for leadership potential uh, the, and the potentially to lead people, not only in combat, but in business, et cetera, and so on. So, you know, we're looking for well-rounded individuals. So there's no use uh, going over that. The, the, on the website, it has our four different regions. We're, we have a pretty small manpower. We have four regional admissions officers. I happen to be the red, the Southeast from West Virginia down to Louisiana. So I would cover your territory. Uh, feel free to drop in on the breakout room and email or call anytime that you want. That concludes mine, and I'll pass it on to Lieutenant Winfrey. Yes, sir. Thank you. Uh, like he said, I'm Lieutenant Winfrey. I'm going to be talking to you about the Air Force Academy. Um, I'm the uh, Air Force Academy Admissions Officer. Um, for North and South Carolina. Slide, please. Um, just a little bit about myself. Waiting for that slide to move. Sorry, maybe it's me. There we go. Um, I'm originally from San Antonio, Texas. Uh, I just graduated from the Air Force Academy in May of 2021, so I'm a, I'm a fresh lieutenant. Um, I majored in behavioral science and minored in religion studies at the academy. Um, some things that I did while I was at the academy, I was a soaring instructor pilot, so um, that's a glider to the right of that um, that I flew. Uh, I also played club basketball, so next to the glider, that's my team. Uh, I was part of the recreational ski and snowboarding club, um, and then I also ran the American Sign Language Club for a little bit. Some things I like to do on my off time, snowboarding, driving my Jeep around. Um, the Air Force Academy is located in Colorado Springs, and it's a great place to go drive up into the mountains. Um, after this, uh, I'll be doing this admissions for about a year, um, but after this, I'll be going to pilot training. Um, so just to look at those pictures really quickly, um, the picture beneath the pilot training, um, those are T-38s, and I got to get a ride in a T-38 down uh, at Randolph Air Force Base in San Antonio, um, and that was after my sophomore year, so it was a great opportunity. Um, beneath that, that's, uh, there's a picture of me jumping into some really cold water, but it's a, an Air Force Academy tradition to jump in the fountains after you've finished your last assignment um, of your cadet career. 
Um, to the right of that, that's uh, me and my friends at a football game. Uh, next to that one, uh, that's another Air Force Academy tradition where you hit your class ring um, on your class crest after the seniors have graduated and they swap out the crests. Um, and then that last picture right there is just me after graduation with my new, new butter bars. Slide, please. So just to talk about what makes the Air Force Academy different from all the other service academies, um, it's the airspace and cyberspace opportunities that we have all four years. Um, so the top left, you can see that's the, the jump program. So it's a guy free falling and, and using a parachute to get back down. Um, you get free, uh, excuse me, five solo free fall jumps um, to get your jump, your jump wings, excuse me. Um, and it's the only place in the world where your first jump is going to be solo. So after a lot of hours of training, you get to jump out of that plane solo on your first, your first jump. Beneath that is our UAS, that's our Unbanned Aerial System uh, program, which is where you learn everything about drones and how to operate them as well. And then you get to do that. In the, the top middle, that's one of our um, powered flight programs. That's actually our, our, uh, our flying team. If you have any previous hours before um, coming to the Air Force Academy, you get the opportunity to try out and fly for our flying team. We also have a second um, powered program, which is more of an introduction. So for anybody who's interested in flying but has never flown before, it's a great opportunity to learn the basics and, and see if they really uh, enjoy flying and wanna make a career out of it. Um, at the end of that program, you actually uh, get the opportunity to solo the aircraft as well. Beneath that, um, that's our cyber. Uh, so in cyber, you'll learn a lot about uh, hacking, uh, security, and how to do some coding as well. To the right of that, that's a, a rocket. Obviously, the Air Force Academy doesn't have its own rocket, um, but that's just to show our space operations. Um, and there you'll get to learn the physics of satellites, uh, do some real life command and control. Um, and then during satellite passes, you'll also uh, get data from them as well. Um, now at the bottom, Right, that is a glider that I mentioned before. Um, for any of you that don't know, a glider is um, a plane that doesn't have an engine. So it attaches to another plane um, and that plane will pull it up into the air and it'll release and do all the normal things a plane should do. Um, this, you get 10 flights. And at the end of that, you get the opportunity to solo fly the aircraft as well. Um, and then after that program, you also get the opportunity to become an instructor pilot which means that you're gonna teach the younger cadets how to fly. Um, so the Air Force Academy actually produces the youngest instructor pilots in the world. So I was an instructor pilot by the time I was 19, which is pretty crazy. Slide please. I'll move on to talk about a little bit more of the Air Force Academy as a whole. Um, there's three tenants that we like to focus on uh, for all four years in order to uh, develop the character and leadership necessary to become a good Air Force officer. So the first one is academics, uh, then we have athletics and military. Slide please. Starting with academics, here's a list of our majors and minors. Um, and like everybody else said, uh, you're going to get a bachelor's of science regardless of what you major in. Um, so you're just going to get a very well-rounded education while still getting to specialize in what you're passionate about. Um, one thing that I do want to note is that because the Air Force Academy currently is the only commissioning source for the Space Force, um, we have been coming out with some new majors and minors uh, specifically geared towards space. Um, so right now, the newest ones in the engineering column, you can see we have space operations. Um, that's new. And then the minor on underneath the social sciences, we have space war fighting. Um, so obviously, those aren't necessary or required in order to um, commission into the Space Force. Um, but if that's something that you would be interested in, it's gonna be a great opportunity um, to get involved and to, to put yourself in a good position for that. Uh, next slide, please. Moving on to athletics. Um, everybody else has been saying it as well, so I won't harp on it too much, um, but every cadet is going to participate in one of three levels, uh, the D1 intercollegiate, uh, club, which is D2 or D3, and then uh, intramural, which means that you're, it's just some friendly competition um, between squadrons. Um, and then every cadet is also going to participate in at least one PE course every semester. Slide, please. 
Um, the other thing that cadets are going to have every semester is the physical fitness test and the aerobic fitness test, PFT and AFT. Um, the PFT is a series of um, workouts that you would do in sequence. And then the AFT is a mile and a half run. And so those are every semester, like I said, uh, unless you get above a 400, it's out of 500. Um, and if you get above a 400, you can validate and be exempt from taking it the next semester. Next slide, please. For the military aspect of it, um, it starts with basic cadet training like the other service academies. Uh, it's six weeks long. The first three weeks are going to be located at the dorms where you learn the basics. Um, and then the second three weeks will be out at Jack's Valley with more rigorous and intense training. Um, that's only the beginning of the four years. Um, and so the, the military training throughout the four years is gonna evolve and look different as you take on different leadership roles and, and get involved in different, uh, different military aspects. Slide, please. Um, looking at the career fields, we have about 35 different career fields right now uh, that are available to uh, academy graduates. 50% of our graduates actually end up going to pilot training, 10% will commission into the Space Force, and then another 10% will end up going to graduate school fully funded by the Air Force. Slide please. Looking particularly at Air Force career opportunities, um, the left column those are going to be the jobs that are longer than a five-year commitment, and that's just because of the extra training that is required for it. Uh, in the center column, that's going to be five-year commitment with no specific degree required. So regardless of what you choose to major in, you can uh, get any one of these jobs graduating from the academy. And then on the right, that's a five-year commitment with a specific degree. So if you want to become an engineer, you're going to have to major in, in, in uh, some engineering course, which makes sense. Uh, one thing I will point out, it's a very common question, um, pilot does not require any uh, specific degree. So if you want to become pilot, you are allowed to do what you want, uh, what you're passionate in, and still get a pilot slot. So I was a behavioral science major, and I got a pilot slot, so you can do it. Next slide, please. Um, now, particularly for the Space Force, as you can see, there's a lot less uh, job opportunities for the Space Force. And that's just because uh, the Space Force is more operational and they don't have those support jobs. Um, so right now, this is what we can commission into the Space Force with, uh, acquisition, space operator, cyberspace, intelligence, and engineering. Next slide, please. So how to get started, uh, just go to academyadmissions.com and click apply now. I'm not gonna talk through the whole application because it's pretty similar to the other service academies. Um, but it'll start with a pre-candidate questionnaire, and that opens up for juniors March 1st. Um, so have that on your radar, juniors or seniors. You can get that going already. Um, for you juniors as well, there's summer seminar. That's an opportunity to go and visit the Air Force Academy. Um, that The application for that will open December to January of this coming year. And then uh, Future Falcon, that's a, an opportunity for those of you who are younger, even starting like sixth grade up, um, to get involved and, and to see what's going on with the Air Force Academy. And those can all be uh, found at academyadmissions.com. Slide, please. Just the last thing. Oh, I think there was a slide before that. Maybe not. Okay, maybe not. That's okay. Um, that's all I have. Oh, okay. There we go. Um, I just wanted to point out some of these numbers because we start off with a lot of applicants at 11,000. Um, and the, for the class of 24, we had 1,100. So looking at that biggest drop from the candidate pool to the qualified candidates, um, don't be intimidated by it because the biggest reason that drop is so large is because uh, students don't finish their application. So ap any application to of the, any of the service academies is gonna be tedious and long, but it's doable. So just finish it and give yourself the best running chance. Um, one thing that we like to say at Air Force Academy admissions is that you must complete to compete. So start that application if you're interested, finish that application and give yourself the best chance you can. Um, and maybe we'll see you in a future class. Slide. That is all I have for you. Um, if you have any questions, my contact information is there um, or you could scan the QR code um, and that'll pull up my contact on your phone if you wanna save it. 
Um, and then if you want me to elaborate on anything that you heard, just ask in the, uh, in the chat after in the, in the breakout rooms afterwards. For now, I'll hand it over to Ms. Clarissa O'Quinn to close us out.